We are living through a paradigm shift in our understanding of human evolution. For example, the adjectives modern and archaic, human and non-human, all carry different connotations. Describe a human, and there are numerous ways to define what a species is. Some people reserve the term human for Homo sapiens alone, in which case Neanderthals would not even qualify. This implies that we have mated with non-humans within the previous 50,000 years, which makes the discussion extremely challenging. Furthermore, the words modern and archaic are challenging. On the one hand, the term modern is used to refer to both modern behavior and modern anatomy, which causes confusion. For instance, it has been said that some early human fossil discoveries are anatomically modern, but not behaviorally modern, that's just too unclear to be helpful. Instead of using the word archaic in the sense of having archaic traits, the term basal is more apt when referring to early members of a human species. Basal directs us away from the ambiguity and baggage that words like archaic, primitive, and modern might bring. Although basal is a relative term in this context, we may at least define it using criteria, such as skeletal characteristics. So instead of using words like primitive, archaic, and modern, use the words basal and derived, for both our ancestry and the Neanderthal lineage. In point of fact, thinking about evolution outside of Homo sapiens is helpful. After they separated from our common ancestor, Neanderthals also underwent a process of evolution. Although Neanderthals at the end of their era were highly developed, and considerably different from how they began potentially 600,000 years ago, they are still referred to as archaic, in comparison to us, moderns, in conventional thought. They developed a larger brain, just like us. When compared to their progenitors from 300,000 years ago, the evolved Homo neanderthalensis had a very different appearance. They acquired a lot of new physical traits over the course of hundreds of thousands of years that weren't present in their common ancestor with Homo sapiens. They evolved features like a face that was pulled forward in the center and a spherical cranium when viewed from behind, a process known as Neanderthalization. In a recent archaeological find, pieces of a skull, including a right parietal, and an almost complete mandible were dated to 140,000 to 120,000 years old. However, the analysis found the individual it belonged to wasn't fully Homo sapiens, nor were they Neanderthal. Neanderthals were was the only other type of human thought to have been living in the region at the time. Instead, this individual falls right smack in the middle, a unique population of humans never before recognized by science. Through detailed comparison with many other fossil human skulls, the researchers found the parietal bone featured archaic traits, that are substantially different from both early and recent Homo sapiens. In addition, the bone is considerably thicker than those found in both Neanderthals and most early Homo sapiens. The jaw too displays archaic features, but also includes forms commonly seen in Neanderthals. The bones together reveal a unique combination of archaic and Neanderthal features, distinct from both early Homo sapiens and later Neanderthals. They are being called the Nesha Ramla hominids. The anthropologists suggest fossils found at other sites, including the infamous Lady of Tabun, might also be part of this new human population, in contrast to their previous Neanderthal or archaic Homo sapiens identification. The Lady of Tabun skull and skeleton was discovered in 1932. It is a female Homo neanderthalensis skull discovered at Tabun Cave at Mount Carmel. Known as Tabun 1, this Neanderthal specimen is around 130,000 years old and 50,000 years old, depending on your source. Extensively studied, this important specimen taught us much about Neanderthal anatomy and behavior, in a time when very little was known about our enigmatic evolutionary cousins. If the Lady of Tabun and others from the Kesem and Zutia caves were indeed members of the Nasha Ramla population, this reanalysis would explain some inconsistencies in their anatomy previously noted by researchers. The Tabun cave was occupied intermittently during the Lower and Middle Paleolithic, 500,000 to around 40,000 years ago. In the course of this period, deposits of sand, silt and clay of up to 82 feet accumulated in the cave. Excavations suggest that it features one of the longest sequences of human occupation in the Levant. Several fossils were discovered at Tabun Cave, including a nearly complete female skeleton, skull and a mandible. The controversial taxonomic attributions of the two fossils are still being discussed. 
In point of fact, the chronological position and or phylogenetic assignment of the fossil remains are still debated. It is of interest to note that the controversies regarding the taxonomic classification of the fossils focused on the mandible specimen, while its stratigraphic attribution seems to be less problematic than that of the skeleton. Some have suggested that the mandible might be associated with archaic members of Homo sapiens, rather than Neanderthals. Others describe the mandible as possessing several traits that linked it with early anatomically modern humans. In contrast, the Taban adult female skeleton is sometimes described as archaic Homo sapiens, but more strictly speaking the specimen is viewed as being part of the Levantine Neanderthal sample. However, peculiarities in the skeletal morphology of Taban were first mentioned in preliminary reports, but today they are rarely questioned. The purpose of a recent new study was to discuss some aspects of the collected data, in the light of the chronological and stratigraphy position of the Taban specimen. The small size of the skull and the overall gracility of the skeleton were two arguments strengthening a female assignment. The anthropologists also suggested that the Taban skeleton had retained more primitive features in her mandible than did her Neanderthal cousins of Europe. In their conclusions on the skull, scientists also noticed the manifestation of neanthropic, such as modern-like characteristics, by the Taban fossils in the overall cranial shape and in the temporomandibular region. In the late 1930s, all the human remains coming from deposits of Mousterian age were assigned to the Neanderthal type, as such discoveries made in Europe were used as references. This can easily explain why the two anthropologists, in their final conclusions on the Taban people, have kept the skeleton within the Neanderthal group, regardless of the anatomical features it manifests. Until the late 1950s, the attribution of all these hominids to Levantine archaic Homo sapiens seemed quite reasonable. Additional discoveries and studies on Paleolithic archaeology and anthropology have introduced a reconsideration of hominids associated with Middle Paleolithic assemblages. Within the Levantine hominid sample, two morphologically distinct groups are now recognized among the bearers of Mousterian lithic industries. The former includes archaic Homo sapiens. Despite the critical importance of the Taban specimens among the human types in the Levantine Mousterian contexts, no recent detailed studies focused on a reconsideration of the Taban skeleton affinities. Scholars emphasize the presence of traits that distinguish this hominid from the Kafzeh school sample and favor a Neanderthal affiliation. While it is clear that the Taban hominid is viewed as being essentially archaic in skeletal anatomy, the evidence used to support its Neanderthal identification is rarely questioned. The circumstances of the discovery of the Taban skeleton have been reported in original field notes, and the discoverer has written about the difficulties related to the extraction of the block containing the skeleton, that had occurred 13 days after its discovery. The skull, which rested on its base with the mandible in place, was badly crushed from above. Indeed, the restoration of the skull presented few difficulties, and joins between cranial fragments were sometimes unreliable. Consequently, the state of preservation of the skull is a major problem in the evaluation of its metrical analysis. It is surprising that other scholars disregard this aspect in their discussion of the specimen's affiliation. It is more reasonable to consider that the most substantial part of the anthropological data from the Taban brain case consists of archaic morphological traits. Discussing the morphology of the Taban skeleton, the archaic features suggest that the specimen was morphologically less advanced than the archaic Homo sapien people. The face consists of the supraorbital torus, the interorbital region, the right pyramidal process, the palate and the mandible. The skeletal traits include cranial features that have been considered to be of phylogenetic relevance in the assignment of fossil specimens to Neanderthals in Europe, and archaic features that are shared by Neanderthals and other fossil hominids. It is clear that the Taban hominid lacks several Neanderthal traits, known as autopomorphies, and possesses few features that distinguish it from a mood. In addition, the mandible retains more primitive, aka plesiomorphic, features than those of Taban mandible and a mood specimens. Such a distinctiveness in mandibular morphology suggests that Taban skull did not belong to the same human group as Taban mandible, according to a recent analysis. While many scholars have referred to the peculiarities of the Taban skull morphology, most of them unequivocally and repeatedly have allocated the specimen to the Neanderthals. The small endocranial capacity of Taban, as well as the recognition of relatively short and gracile limb bones were employed to assert a female assignment to the skeleton. 
Yet, the differences in bone structure between the tabun and archaic sapiens might reflect more than sexual dimorphism. Comparison of postcranial bones between tabun and other Levantine hominids reveals a mixture of archaic, among them features shared with Neanderthals, modern like and unique features. For instance, some have interpreted the distinctive aspects of the tabun hip bone as indicative of the antiquity of the specimen. The tabun hominid retains portions of the hip bone that provide morphological data on the ilium, the sciatic notch and the pubic bone. Compared to other middle paleolithic specimens, the most striking features of tabun hip bone lie in its overall gracility, such as a small iliac blade, and the configuration of the superior pubic ramus, which is rather long and thin in its vertical dimension. Case in point, the Kebra II is a 60,000-year-old Levantine Neanderthal male skeleton. It was discovered in a Mousterian layer of Kebra cave. To the excavators, its disposition suggested it had been deliberately buried, though like every other putative Middle Paleolithic intentional burial, this has been questioned. Kebra II is the most complete Neanderthal skeleton ever found, and has played a major role in three debates on Neanderthal anatomy and behavior, namely the anatomical constraints of childbirth, their ability to speak, and the shape and size of their chests. The first of these debates has helped settle, the second it has not, and the third it has sparked, by questioning the barrel shape that Neanderthal chests were thought to have, since they were described by Hermann Schaffhausen in 1858. The skeleton is male, but because it preserved a nearly complete pelvis, it helped settle the debate as to whether Neanderthals had different childbirth-related constraints than those of modern humans. The cranium was deliberately removed sometime after the ligaments that attached it to the spine had decomposed. Indeed, the skull and teeth of most Neanderthal specimens are better preserved than the postcranial body, especially its fragile bones such as the hyoid and the cervical vertebrae. Having found most of the postcranial body, one would have expected to find the skull and teeth. Kebra II was the first Neanderthal specimen for which the hyoid bone was preserved, a bone found in the throat and closely related to the vocal tract. Its anatomy was virtually identical to a modern one leading the excavators to suggest that Neanderthals had at least part of the physical requirements for speech. This debate was hotly divisive, with some authors taking the similarities of Neanderthal and modern hyoid bones to mean that Neanderthal had vocal skills comparable to modern humans, and others pointing out that pigs too have hyoid bones similar to those of modern humans. If Neanderthals could speak, they might have had a narrower than modern range of vocal sounds since the skull base of some Neanderthals resembles those of modern human infants more than adults. Today many anthropologists believe Neanderthal behavior is too complex to be explained, without at least some form of basic language. Chest shape and size are important in reconstructing the paleobiology of Neanderthals, the large shape of its thorax having been interpreted as reflecting high activity levels, its adaptation to the cold, though this has been questioned, and a high body mass. Kebra II's thorax is the only well-preserved Neanderthal ribcage and has been studied extensively. The lower rib area flared, giving the whole ribcage a bell-shaped appearance, rather than the barrel-shaped one Neanderthals were, for a century and a half, thought to have had.